Hey guys, welcome back to another episode. I am so pumped for the conversation that I am having today with my guest, Holly Matthews. She is here to help you feel more happy and less crappy. Holly is a former TV actress. She is a widowed mom of two, self-development coach and founder of the Happy Me Project, an online and in-person straight-talking self-development program. She is a TEDx speaker, has appeared on BBC, Talk Radio, The Daily Mail, Mirror, The Sun. I mean, all of the things that you can be on, she has been on. Her, the Happy Me Project has had two sellout tours across the UK and has seen thousands of men and women go through its virtual doors and now has a podcast of the same name. She's a regular guest expert on podcasts, radio, and TV, and has amassed a major following across all of her social media platforms. During the pandemic, she has stepped up as a leader in her field and was nominated for a Great British Entrepreneur Award. So she is here in all of her glorious accent because I love it so much. Hey, Holly. Hi there. Thank you so much. You know what? It always makes me laugh when people have to try and sum up my 36 years on this planet because it's a lot of stuff. And when I hear it, even I'm like, wow, yeah, that's a lot of stuff when you write it down. Uh Uh-huh. And you're awesome. And you've done all of the things and you're here today to talk about the Happy Me Project and also talk about your own journey because it always has not been peaches and cream and rainbows. Um, You've actually have a really hard story and you have figured out how to turn that pain into purpose and power. So let's start there. Why don't we start and talk about um, the journey that you've gone on recently with your husband? Yeah, so um, in two, well, in 2014, so I've got two kids. So I've got my, my, my oldest is Brooke and my, my youngest is Texas, very American. And um, they, <laughs> yeah, they're both, they're, one is 10 and one is eight now. So just young girls. And when, so when they were, my youngest was, I think mean, she must have been about two. So it was like 2014, my husband was diagnosed with brain cancer. Now, prior to this, we lived normal-ish. Well, not at all normal. That's not true. We'd lived our lives as two entrepreneurs and I was an actress at the time and he had his own business and we spent our lives pottering around together, just drinking cups of tea, being very English and um, just having a laugh. We were mates. We were really good friends as well as him being my husband and we just spent all our time together from the minute that we met. And that wasn't in any kind of like, I don't know, like a need to be around each other or a jealousy or anything. We just enjoyed each other's company and gave each other space to just be. And that was, it was just how we, and we used to say all the time, how those that play together, stay together. You know, those that enjoy each other's company, that that's, and that's what we did. And then in 2014, he had started to have some headaches and was going through some depression and we couldn't really sort of pinpoint where that was coming from and initially sort of put it down to the fact that he was on the autistic spectrum and um, had been diagnosed with Asperger's and we sort of thought perhaps having two young kids the fast-paced change had affected him from a mental health point of view and we were doing all the stuff that you do when somebody's going through that kind of stuff but it kind of didn't make sense as much as, you know, mental health stuff rarely makes sense, but they just didn't seem to be coming from anywhere. And um, it was coming from a brain, ca- it was coming from brain cancer. It was coming from literally something pushing on parts of his brain and affected him. So he was diagnosed with a rare form of brain cancer from the beginning. It was normally found in children. It was normally found in the back of the head. His was at the front and in ad- it was just, it is was a lot. The, is that DPIG? Was that the kind? No, it was called, um, oh, it's gone out of my head now. Um, it's The name of it's gone out of my head, but it's really rare. It's not even, it's not one that they know. And I think that was the frustrating thing at the beginning, although we were always very optimistic because I think we both kind of felt we'd always lived our lives doing things that the majority of people don't. So why not give it a shot? And, you know, from the very beginning, he was always like, I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to do my best. I'm not, I'm going to give it a fight. I'm not giving up. Like I'll do whatever I've got to do, but equally I'm not going to live my life. Like I've got cancer just because everybody says that's how you live your life. And at the very beginning, people would try and as they do tell you their version of events of how it's happened to their friend and the, 
how awful chemotherapy is or radiotherapy or brain, you know, they know someone who knows someone who had it really mm-hmm. bad. And I particularly, you know, being in the, even though that was quite early in my stages of, of mindset work being my actual paid work, I always did that stuff. So I was shutting everybody down left, right and center. Don't tell me your story. He doesn't need to know your story. He didn't read anything about cancer whatsoever because he was like, well, if I read that stuff, I'm just going to think I've got that symptom. And, and so for the majority of the time that he had cancer, although he had seizures and he had, you know, the stuff that goes when you've got brain cancer and brain surgeries and radio and chemo, he, we lived around it. We just lived a good life. And, you know, if somebody were to have stumbled on on my social media, they'd have seen somebody who had a great life who, you know, I was still working as an actress. I was still doing other bits and pieces. I was, you know, working as a coach and, it was in 2017 when he just couldn't keep that cancer at bay any longer. And it, it, in 2016, he had a second brain surgery and we knew from then they tick a different box. So first time they were taken to essentially give it a shot. Let's try and cure this. Let's give this a go. In 2016, it had just taken hold too much and they were prolonging is the box they take. And that was hard when we when we knew that box was ticked, you kind of know that your days are numbered. But again, we still didn't kind of we didn't sit in the space of, okay, that's it done and dusted. We just went, let's just do what we've got to do. Our motto was always whatever it takes. And we would say all of the time, okay, what's next? What do we do next? And it just got to a stage where there was no there was no what next. It was what's my next. And that was obviously very very different and a different space to be and he died in July 2017 so it's not that long ago but yet feels a million years ago in a weird weird space and so you have young kids now you're a widow how do you actually change your mindset around that because that is like I mean that's that work seems almost impossible to try to turn something positive into something that happened that is so sad and you know so traumatic and but yet here you are creating something called the happy me project so how the heck did you yeah how do we get there it's I guess that's hard for people to get in their heads I've always been a person who reframed so I was always a person who took something bad something hard and went where's the good where's the lessons where's the something around it so I was very good at that anyway and I think that comes from being an actress so we're very resilient as actors because we get lots of knockbacks even though I you know I had a successful career I you know I was a working actress which I think these days is something to be there's something to be said about actually being regularly in work but even with that you know there's so many knockbacks that I had built a level of resilience in general and in the three and a half years that he had cancer and we knew Although I was positive, although I was forward thinking, I wasn't stupid. I'm not, there's a, there's a big difference in terms of being blindly positive and being living in reality. And the reality is this is really bad. And he used to say, and he was very direct, you know, having autism, they're like, they're literally black and white. There's no, he's like, I'm look, I'm dead or I'm alive. We don't have to talk about it. And he would say, look, this will get me this will get me in the end, whether it's 10 years from now or 50, this will get me. I I won't survive this. This is too bad. And so I think along the way, I was very aware of that fact. And so I would really bank each moment that we had together. And I would call it banking moments. And I don't know, people probably call that different things, but it would just be that I knew that the the big stuff wouldn't matter as much, you know, the wedding, you know, we got, we got married on our own, by the way, we didn't tell anyone, we just ran off and got married. And that was in our hoodies and trainers and football or soccer (laughs) and just, just got married. So it wasn't the big stuff like that. I knew that that's when it comes down to life and death. It's not even those moments that you care about. It's the everyday it's the sitting, watching TV together. It's the boring, it's the, you know, cooking dinner and chatting. It's that. And so along the, during those three and a half years, I would notice those moments. I would be so in the moment of that. And I would, in my mind, literally visual, I'm a very visual person. So I would take almost a snapshot of what that moment was. And I'm so glad that I did that because actually being so present in doing that, 
there are there are moments in my mind that are so cemented in and they're nothing moments into anybody else to explain them they're nothing moments but they're moments that were important in who we were and so I think doing that and I took loads of photographs and I was aware that you know my daughters would want to know stuff and my YouTube channel I very much vlogged the journey of that so anyone who's going through grief or going through a similar thing there's lots on there in fairness I've not watched any of it and um, so God knows what I said but um, <laughs> I have no idea but that kind of that was helpful for me it was very cathartic and that helped the process for me I I'm not a person that can I don't enjoy counseling or things like that that's not my way of working I don't sit in that space so my way of getting stuff out was to just talk about it and to find my understanding of it was well if I talk about it one it'll be good for me it's to get out it's good for my daughters in the future and somebody else out there needs this to hear it and so I think that was helpful for my process and during his time so his last few weeks um being alive he was in a hospice in the UK and that time was almost for me like an athlete training to do a marathon like I knew how bad this was and in the UK, there was a lot of press surrounding his death. So it was in the newspapers every day. And that was, a, that was a lot, as you can imagine, that was a, a big, a big deal to have all eyes on, you know, everybody in the hospice knew what was happening, the nurses, the doctors, it was a lot. And I really had to zone in. And it was, it was genuinely, it was a decision in my head where I went, look, you can do this grief stuff, or you can do this widow stuff, how you see it on TV the black veil the depression that the, and you go on pinterest and i was doing this i'm lying by his bed watching him literally die and i'm going find search and pinterest and youtube and trying to find somebody that looked like me somebody that talked like me somebody that was my age and i was 32 and i'm going who's i want somebody to talk to me straight tell me how, what it looks like when somebody dies how does that you know that was scaring me you know no, not knowing those having those answers and then as I was going through it and I'm really struggling to find somebody who talked in as matter of fact a way as I do, I just thought, you know, if you can't say that, you've got to be it. You've got to step up and you've got to talk because you're experiencing this or somebody else's as well. This is not isolated. You're not that special, you know, and in, in a nicest way. I'm not that special that my, my understanding of this is that unique. There's somebody else that needs to hear this same perspective. And so I sat there and I meditated and I focused on letting go of control because I had none and knowing okay I can control this bit I can control whether I get up and get dressed and put my makeup on and to some people that was bizarre why is she dressed why is she got makeup on and her hair washed but it was something I could control I could control nothing else so I could get I could get ready I did a second life coaching qualification at the hospice because it was just something to focus on and what happened with the Happy Me project was because there was such a huge amount of press on what I was doing comes with that press and that is people. People come with that and they go, how do I do that? Because I can't deal with the fact my ironing pile is really big and, and you seem to be dealing with the fact your husband's dying in some sort of way. So how do I do that? And so I had already been coaching, but this was a different space where I went, it just need to make it as simple as possible and put something out so the initial thing was a co an evergreen course for people to go and do I did some audios some videos some workbooks I packaged it up I put it out into the world with zero expectation just a way of going well you can do this like it, it was it's it was it still is it's still the same price since I started it it's a 30 pound course an English pound course. it's not it's not an expensive thing an expensive program but I wanted it to be accessible to everyday men and women that were going through this stuff and know that although I couldn't coach they couldn't have potentially afforded me I could give them that and I could just push that out and and that was good for me because it was good for me to channel that into something as well. So what are some of the tips that if someone who is going through something and right now everyone is going through something, whether it's, yeah. you know, a loss of a marriage, a loss of a job, a loss of life as they know it, like how do they channel their own 
inner happy me and kind of get out of that funk that so many of us find ourselves in, especially this past year. Yeah, for sure. And I think this last year is interesting in that we've all grieved in different ways, but it's been a grief of the, the, the year that we expected to have. And so there's a real collective nature in that. I think firstly, it starts with a decision that you're going to change, you're going to make it work because it would be very easy just to lay down and just give up. But I think you have to firstly go, right, I'm going to take back, I'm going to take charge of this because there is so much in, in the same way when I was in the hospice and I was recognizing my lack of control and what was happening, we've had that same experience collectively in that we can't control the, the spread of, a, of the coronavirus, but yeah. we can control what we do with our time and our space. And so firstly, a decision, the next step I would say is get really ruthless with your space and what you allow into it. Like that is so important when you're going through tough stuff, you need to create some boundaries that make sense to you. Like, what are you watching on telly? Who are you listening to? Who are you hanging around with? Who, whose stories are you allowing into your space? And anytime I've gone through difficult stuff, and, and including the beginning of the pandemic, you know, as a single widowed mom, suddenly I'm told, get in the house, school your children, and run a business. And I have ADHD, which means my brain wanted to run about and do things. And I was, I was caged inside, told to get inside. So when I, at the beginning of this pandemic, I did a similar thing in that I thought to myself, what did I do when Ross died? What did I do in that space that will help me through this? How can I parallel them? And the one thing I really noticed that I did is in, and this is not necessarily for everybody, but you'll find your own version of this, was I recognized that in my difficult times, I need to create and not consume. So when I consume and I go online and I scroll and I get other people's news and ideas of what's going on, my head spins, I go down a rabbit hole, I compare all of the stuff that we do when we go online. When I create, and whether your create might be you create a nice home, my create might be my work, but everybody's is very different. So when you find something that focuses your attention away from the painful things, that's really important. And I think that starts with going, looking at your life, what are the bits that bring me joy and what bits just don't feel great? And, and even people, and we can care about these people, by the way, as well. Sometimes we have people in our lives we love, but they're really negative or they're just not good when you're not feeling good. And I had some, some friends, if I'm being very ruthless and honest, friends who I love and care about, but their, their journey is not quite where I'm at. And so they are sitting in a space of victimhood I could not be around people like that then. I just couldn't. They, I don't want their version of it. I wanted to protect my space. So definitely getting very ruthless with and looking at what you're allowing into your space, especially the new. That's hard to do because I think, especially as women, we are raised as people pleasers. We're like mm -hmm. the good girl, the good wife, the good employee, the good, you know, everything. So, and we put everyone else's needs and making sure they're happy before our own. So when you get ruthless and start saying no and getting really comfortable mm -hmm. saying no, it is so uncomfortable at the beginning, but yet it does get easier as you go. And so it's much. so liberating too. Like now I used to do that all the time. Like I used to say yes to everything, the things I didn't want to do. And now I'm just like, nope. Like the month of June for me, I have blocked off as a cre uh, as a creativity month where I'm oh, writing. Wow. And I have said no to everything that has come up in June. And I've been ruthless about it. I'm like, cause you know what? There's always July. I can deal with all of yes. that in July, but that's hard to do. It's so hard to do, but it doesn't, it get, it gets easier. Like I will yeah. say to people often with my clients, go and flex your no muscle, right? Cause you haven't said no enough. So you need to flex that little bit. You need to, you need to wake that up. And how empowering is it to say no and it be a full sentence and it not have all of the, the, the stuff after it, the rolling excuses and the uh -huh. reasons why, like, it's just really liberating. And I have to say, my husband definitely taught me that because he was so matter of fact, I mean, ruthlessly so, because his autism just didn't allow the space for any reason for that. You deal with it. And he used to say to me a lot, actually, they've allowed themselves to be offended. <laughs> and that oh, is I not that. 
I know, and that is not something we're comfortable with, but it's yeah. true. It's true. Yeah. We allow ourselves to be offended by certain things. You know, we've interpreted things in a certain way. And he would say that all the time. They've allowed themselves to be. So he was really good at saying, no, I don't want to. I mean, he would be, We, I mean, as women, we don't get taught this. And as polite society, we don't. If someone came round to our house who hadn't text first and said they were coming, he wouldn't even let them sit down. He would just be like, why have you come around without texting? Like family members as well, by the way. And they'd just be like, oh, well, you know, we're just in the area. We're just going to pop in. And he would be like, well, why would you do that? You've got a phone. Why didn't you ring ahead? We're busy. <laughs> I mean, that's a different level. We're not expecting you to get there. But if people, those that are listening, it is really very, very helpful. It's, it's when, it, when you're going through tough stuff or just in normal life to learn to just flex that and create a space for you to be okay with that. Initially, it's going to be really uncomfortable. But once you start what you do is you educate those around you. So yes, initially the version of you that they know and they understand, this version said yes to everything and people pleased and you know attended to their every whim and behaved in a way that they were they were comfortable with. When you don't do that anymore, there will be a kickback initially. We've warned you about that. So now that's yeah. going to happen. You can think in your head, oh, this is what they were talking about. So that's going to happen, but it doesn't happen for very long. There's this awkward stage where people are like, oh, okay. And they're a little bit affronted because they don't know how to respond. It's not their fault. It's not our fault either. It's just they don't know how to work out who this new version is. It won't take them long. It's a bit like with our kids, right? When we, we're trying to you know, parent our kids and create unfuzzy boundaries which I'm terrible at so I have to get better at these when I say you can't have your iPad and then I need them to have their iPad for 10 minutes yeah. while I do something <laughs> but it's the same with our friends <laughs> yeah, like have your iPad and have the cakes yeah. um, but our friends and family are the same aren't they you know we we have to train them in the same way that this is who I am now you know I train all my friends to understand that I either will respond to you immediately on a text message or I will probably forget it's even happened and I love you all the same and it's not coming from a place of dislike but it's just how it is and it's okay it because we're in a society where now we have immediate access to everything our phones and so it's expected that like why didn't someone respond to me why did it take them three hours to respond to me yes yeah Mm. um and I love that everything that you just said is great advice for dealing with ex-spouses too for setting boundaries and it's so difficult especially when you're in a pattern with somebody and all of a sudden you show up in a different way and you push back in a different way and they're like what the heck is this this isn't the way that she was or he was before such such good advice so holly do you think that can you actually make the leap and say that there was a gift from the pain that you went through yeah i can and it's so it's a really weird space isn't it when you when you understand that and i think i understand that as well that Ross and I were always as a couple very very black and white with each other Mm -hmm. and very honest so I kind of have his mindset there as well knowing that he would be like just get on with your life like there's there's no there's no more reason for me to be dead than anybody else like he would always say there's no more reason for that to have happened than which leaf falls off the tree it does no sense in it and so I think that helps me but I definitely look at the stuff that I've achieved since his death and know that that wouldn't have happened had he still been here. And that's what a weird headspace to be in. But I think if we can look at that, obviously the death of somebody that you love is the, is the big one, but relationships, job losses, there's so many things that we go through that are painful. And I've always said it is never top trumps on who's had it worst. Okay. It is not who's had the worst sadness because if you feel pain because somebody doesn't like your outfit or you feel pain because your husband died, it's pain. It's still pain. It doesn't matter what the reason these things that we're talking about will help in all aspects of that. If you can take everything painful and understand the benefit of that pain that I wouldn't be as strong as I am I wouldn't be as resourceful as I am I wouldn't be as empathetic and I certainly and this is a it's quite a strange one that's come about for me as vulnerable and open to being vulnerable because my set point before Ross's death was put on your war paint 
be strong, be the loudest and the most confident in the room and nobody can touch you. And that's not a good space in terms of building relationships. And actually after his death, I just realized I don't understand the world. The world that I knew had Ross alive in it. And now that's not the case. I need to relearn everything. So there's always that space, whatever you're going through, whether it's burnout because of the pandemic, whether it's, you know, just you've lost your job, you've relationship breakup, whatever's gone on. There are so many lessons. And even though in the thick of it, when you're right in the, the pain, that moment, you might not be able to understand what that is. Just have in your mind at some point, I will have learned there will be something good from this. Yeah. There always is, always. There's always something. It's science, right? Whether you're whatever you believe about the world, it's science. For every positive, there is a negative. And that's just how it goes. So we can do that in our life experiences as well. And it, that all goes back to mindset and, and getting and making that decision to get unstuck or, and finding the positive because I think it's easy to not want to find the positive and to mm-hmm. say, oh, this awful thing happened to me. Poor me. Why did it happen to me? Like that's, that's the easy place to go. It's hard. It takes strength. And I think you're right. I I love what you said about vulnerability because I think I'm the same way. And for a really long time, it was like, you know, you pull the, the shell around you and that's, that's your strength. And I've kind of learned that that's not it at all. It's like your strength is showing up and being so honest and authentic and, and just being like, Hey, like, this is, this is it. Like, this is the real deal. This is what I've gone through. And, and that's so hard to do. And I think that that's where, you know, that there's so much connection in that though. And that's where people, um, they, they connect with you. Everyone has a story. Everyone has kind of like a, their own version of their me too story. And, um, there's so much beauty in that. And I think like, if you're going to talk about a silver lining of COVID, I feel yeah. like that has been the silver lining of just connections. I mean, you and I would have never connected had COVID not happened quite frankly. No, oh, it's so true. There's been so many connections like that. And I think it's been a leveler because yeah. it's just made people go, do you know what? It doesn't, I mean, all right. I'm not saying that people haven't had different circumstances because of course they have. Um, but even, you know, even if you are very wealthy, uh, they, you're still, there's still COVID in the world. You still yeah. can't move around and say that you, and I think that's been really interesting. And we haven't been able to, people haven't been able to pretend as well as they did before. You know, like we had pictures, you know, Instagram, such a a place where people fake their lives. They can't fake their lives when they can't get out to fake their lives. (laughs) That's right. So (laughs) interesting from the comparison culture. And actually, so what it's meant is we've had to be humans and we've had to connect on a much more real level. And I that's my space that I love like I like the awkward uncomfortable gray area in life like that's what I want to talk about I'm like the worst person at and you might be the same because you're a a thinking person but I'm like the worst at small talk (laughs) people are like they want to talk to me about I don't know Love Island or something like I don't know I don't even know what they want to talk about they want to talk about stuff that I don't understand and I'm like let's talk about your deepest darkest fears and desire (laughs) about that instead I'm just the worst so I but I love that and I think there's been so much I've noticed in the last year my business has like really been going well during the pandemic which is a a weird flip side to to a pandemic but because suddenly everybody especially because the happy me project my brand is very accessible in that I like things to be I always say self-development doesn't have to be fancy it can be if you want it to be but it can I like to get things to the basic level of the bare bones of what we can do tangible stuff that we can do to actually have an impact on our day-to-day lives I like things to be simple and I think because of that that appeals to a wider market that wouldn't have necessarily done the woo-woo candles and crystals and chanting in the forest. They're not, you know, (laughs) Dave the bricklayer is not going to do that. Like he's not, he's not going to get his sage out. No, he's not. So, you know, I think I've seen in the last year, people who never considered positive mindset are now in a space where they feel rubbish. They don't feel good. And so they're looking for something and stumble upon my stuff. And I found a huge increase in people who say to me, I never thought about this stuff before. I just thought it was for other people or people that were depressed or people who needed to go to a counselor or needed antidepressants. And I didn't think it was for people like me, but 
the pandemic has hit all of my stuff got taken all of my distraction and now I'm just sat here with my own thoughts and they're not what I want them to be and I I definitely think that's been a really big positive that we've been so self-reflective and we've had these big conversations about race and about um there is so much the me too stuff like that that's all come more out into the open more these big conversations about safety and this is good. I mean, it feels painful and just uncomfortable at the time, but I really, I feel this will be good going forward. Holly, how do, how do my listeners connect with you, follow you, join the happy me project and all of the things? Well, they can find my podcast. My podcast is the happy me project. And if you go onto Instagram and Facebook, Facebook, I have a Facebook group so they can come and hang out in there. And I tend to go live most weeks in there and on my YouTube channel as well, which is currently in the process of moving away from what was Holly Matthews online to happy me TV. So it's going to be much more just focused on mindset. My kids might still pop in now and then as they do (laughs) on some stuff but it's definitely going to be more mindset. So if they type in Holly Matthews into Google, they will find me. They can come and say hi. And please do let me know that you came from this podcast as well, because it's always good to know where people come from. Yeah. And of course, I will put all of your contact information in the show notes. Holly, you are an absolute treat to have on here. I am so glad that we connected and I'm so grateful for you and your conversation and just you being vulnerable and sharing your journey with us. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me.